What is up, everybody? Ryan from Sports Card Radio. That's right, we're back. Wow. It has been a little while. Hopefully, absence makes the heart grow fonder in your case. Another episode of the R rated podcast hosted and found exclusively on sportscardradio.com. Hey, there may not have been a podcast in a while, but um, got our boy working on the site over on Sports Card Radio, and he does a bang up job because. Uh, I don't have to do anything, and uh, you know he's putting up stuff and seems to be learning cards a little bit. So head on over there. If you notice some stuff being put up, it is uh, done by uh, one of our guys, um, he's, and I think he's doing a great job. So sportscardradio.com, uh, go check it out. makes my life a whole lot easier having somebody um, updating the site. Uh, checklists, release state calendars, little, little kind of knick-knack stuff. Uh, I, the tops now print runs every day, the tops living set, things like that, that have come out. So go check that out. But wow, it's been a little while since we've had a podcast and as somebody, I listen to a lot of podcasts myself and sometimes I'm sitting there kind of refreshing some of my favorite ones waiting for that new episode. And you know, it's been, I don't know, like six weeks since there's been, uh, a sports card radio, uh, podcast. So uh, it's shocking that my brother and I still have what little following we have because, uh, you know, these podcasts um, come uh, so infrequently sometimes. And I know we're both we're both sensitive to that because we were both uh, we started as podcast listeners. And this was way back almost like 10 years ago listening to poker podcasts. And um, that's kind of, uh, you know, the genesis of the entire Sports Card Radio site and probably why there are even Sports Card Radio podcasts is from some uh, our original listening to poker content and poker content uh, podcast kind of all back when podcasts got started. So we're certainly sensitive that uh, we're not cranking out regular episodes or the hey, there's going to be an episode every Friday or shoot, there's podcasts that do daily episodes uh, in some t- topics and, uh, you know, twice a week and stuff. So that's not our style. That's not our game. Maybe that's one of the reasons why you've kind of stuck with us, uh, over the years. And we certainly appreciate it. And, uh, certainly not going to go anywhere. Even if the podcasts are infrequent, um, there's, they're still on the way and they're, uh, still coming down the pipe. And in some respects, I know the last podcast uh, that my brother and I did was about the top sale. In some respects, that is such a high for my brother and I, and probably not for very many people in the hobby that that's kind of a, a, a passing rumor or a story or something you have to wait for more information on. But when Bloomberg puts out a story that the tops company might be for sale, that is like such a rush and such a uh, high that, uh, you know, once you come down off that, it, it's hard to kind of gear yourself up. Uh, you know, you almost need a, a, another tidbit of news from that story for the, for the tops to actually sell or for some kind of story, uh, breaking news story to exceed that, you know, like another Panini blunder or just something, you know, catastrophic or, or exciting in the sports card world um, to happen to kind of gear up to uh, talk about uh, uh, you know, sports cards again on a podcast. So hopefully uh, that makes sense that, you know, when something huge happens like Dak Prescott, like tops being rumored for sale, or if tops ever, you know, ends up uh, selling or a license change, that is such a rush. I know for me and probably for my brother that, you know, it, it probably, you know, it takes a little while to kind of come down off of that and then gear up to talk about cards again. But uh, I don't, on this, on today's podcast, I've got a few card topics, but we also have a little bit of off-topic stuff because that's kind of what I've been doing the last uh, several months, actually. Aside from uh, you know jumping in there on the on the tops topic, we haven't, as you know, if you're listening to this, we haven't had a podcast in a while. But here's what I've got down, card topic wise. Hey, let's talk a little bit about Otani and my thoughts there. And uh, why I don't think it, it's going to quite live up to some of the past uh, prospects or studs that we've s- seen come along that have a big kind of breakout rookie year or first year or big year and their cards explode. Why I think some of the Otani stuff is, is going to be tempered a little bit, but some ways you can jump in and maybe profit uh, uh, off Otani. You know, 
we've take a, taken a little break from podcasting for over a month. What if you take a little break from collecting? What could you do during that time when you're maybe either consciously or maybe even like subconsciously taking a break from collecting? We've probably all been there. Uh, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably semi-serious about cards, or at least I would hope so. I don't know why you wouldn't be semi-serious about cards and, and, and listening to this. But you've probably, over the course of your life at some point, taken a break from collecting, whether that's a month, six months, a year, five years, sometimes it's ten years. People jump back into it, sometimes longer than that. What could you be doing during that time Knowing that, hey, maybe you're going to get back into collecting or maybe you know uh, you've done this before and it's a temporary break. Maybe it's a bad rookie class or you just kind of get bored. There could be a number of reasons why uh, you stop uh, your interest in card collecting, but you know it's something you're going to come back to. And I'll give actually some other examples when I start talking about this. About this is, Look, you... you you, you don't probably don't realize it, but you take a break from a lot of things in your life that you enjoy, that you thoroughly enjoy, but you come back to them. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then what, what are some of the things you could do kind of in the process of taking those breaks to prepare for when you do come back? And, um, you know, I might be in one of those little break modes myself, but I'm do, I'm consciously doing some things and thinking about, hey, when I come back, to buy some cards here. This is what I'm going to do. And here's my plan. So I'll talk a little bit about my um, break and what I'm doing during my break to uh, prepare for when I go hard again, uh, you know, buying or collecting cards again. We'll read some text. There has been some text to the sports card radio text line 702-900-2149. Again, that Las Vegas number is 702-921-49. Full disclosure, your text might be read on the air, and it will be today. And a couple other little quick updates. As fabulous as the Las Vegas Strip is, I will be moving, shockingly enough. I've only been out here for about uh, five, six months, but I am moving. I really, really like Vegas, but I love the Tempe, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Arizona area. So that's where I'm headed. I'll, I'll talk about that. And because I've been in Vegas for the last five months and Vegas is a place that I've come to quite often, I'll give a little recommendations on some food, uh, uh, some dining, some where to stay, and... Um, some Vegas advice when you come here, some things you, you can, small advice, and a couple celebrities that I've seen around Vegas since I've been here. You know what I really want to mention though, and here, you know, this is the eight minute sports card radio R rated podcast intro here. Interview guest, if you listen to the last uh, podcast actually that, that I did, was an interview with Wax Heaven. I encourage you to check it out if you haven't listened to it. Uh, kind of one of the, predecessors almost for me in the sports card reporting game this guy was doing it you know back when before sports card radio and i, I think i was running a, a shop at this point it was 2007 i think to about to that late 2010 when he was kind of in his head i remember people coming to my shop mentioning him so it was really fun for me to interview him and um that might have cracked the door on some other potential interview guests i've reached out to some people and I would encourage you, if, if you want to tell a story or your story or your collecting story, to reach out to me. Uh, it is something that I enjoy doing. It's not going to be a Barbara Walters interview or a Jake Tapper CNN interview. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to have a PTI first take debate or whatever it's called. You know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, let whoever I'm talking to tell their story. I can come back on this podcast anytime I want and talk by myself and counterpoint what somebody said or what somebody wrote or what the perception is or what, what I, you see what I'm saying? So, uh, if it's something you're interested in, you can always reach out to me. Twitter DM is the best sports card news 
on Twitter. If you if you at tweet or tweet Sports Card Radio, that would go to my brother. And he may not know what you're talking about. So you're going to want to do Sports Card News on Twitter. That's probably the best way, honestly. And I have DM, DMs to where you can just DM me. If you've never signed up for Twitter or anything, you can just instantly mail me uh, through there. But I will, uh, it's something I really enjoy doing. It's something uh, indirectly, not technically interviewing, but I've been, you know, you're kind of, if you live in Vegas, you're kind of thrust into the social scene. So I talk to a lot of different people and um, I enjoy doing that. I enjoy kind of like fleshing out somebody's story and um, just hearing what they have to say and kind of getting to um some finer details on thing and and with cards since i do have a little a little bit of a knowledge about cards i I love to talk to people about cards it's something that you know when i go to the national i do off microphone and when you know a lot of times i have these wonderful great conversations with lots of different people and uh hopefully this year when i go i can work some people to doing some things uh some audio some some interviews and uh it's definitely something uh, that I that I want to keep doing. I thought I had something lined up this week actually with somebody, um, and things just kind of fell through. Not really on my end. I think maybe they just got cold feet and didn't didn't want to do it. And I think that the perception is that maybe you're going to get on the Sports Card Radio R rated podcast, and I'm going to see an in Jake Tapper you, or you know, this is going to be some kind of like debate. And um, that's just not. That's not my that's not my style. I don't, you know, when I'm out in Vegas talking to people or meeting people or meeting girls or whatever on a date or something, I'm not trying to debate them about stuff even if I I don't agree or it's something that I'm not into that we're talking about. Um a lot of times I just kind of like to hear somebody's story and, and their passions and stuff. So, just keep that in mind. And uh a slight teaser speaking of interviews, there could be a potential fairly high profile guest on the R rated podcast. So I'll just tease that certainly somebody, uh, my much higher profile than, uh, you would think would come on this podcast. Hopefully he doesn't listen to some of the past episodes or, or this won't happen. So, uh, somebody fairly high up in the sports card game. Um, look for that maybe in the next, uh, sometime, maybe late next month. So little teaser there. Okay, the 12 minute and 36 second intro is over. Let's talk about Otani a little bit. I've watched him play a little bit. Uh, they played the Giants uh, recently in a series. I think he only went like one for seven in the series. He might be pitching today. Um, he's in, he swings hard, actually. I can see why he makes good contact. I mean, the, the guy gets uh, a lot of energy and kind of juice through the ball with his swing. A little Ichiro-ish swing. Ichiro, I think, has a little bit more back control. This guy kind of guns for it a little more. Swings, I feel like, a little harder. Um, Probably going to strike out way, way, way more than uh, Ichiro ever will in the big leagues. But hate to to compare guy, you know, kind of Japan guys together. I think that's kind of unfair. But their swings are, you know, when you watch them, you put them up together. They're they're a little similar. Kind of fall into first base a little bit. But... Here's the thing about Otani, and I think we can all remember to last year when Aaron Judge started, you know, just hitting home runs, home runs. I don't know what he ended up with, 45 or 50 or something. Just a huge number for a rookie. Here's the difference between Aaron Judge and Otani. Aaron Judge cards were starting at a place that were like $5. I mean, you could get an Aaron Judge autograph last year for like, you know, 5 to $20. You could probably get a sweet amazing Aaron judge card last year before the season for like less than a hundred dollars, like something crazy that probably was that went on to be worth, you know, thousands of dollars, potentially some of his Bowman stuff just absolutely blew up, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for some of the rare parallels and stuff. I don't know if the super fractor ever sold or what happened there, but I seem to recall there were some like rare, rare parallels, you know, BGS nine fives or whatever that's sold for uh, like, I don't know, like several thousand, maybe $10,000. So this is huge money. On those Aaron Judge cards. But those were coming from a place of like near zero. I and mean, it's like Bitcoin. I mean, Aaron Judge is like Bitcoin. You know, he started at $5 and went to 1000 Whereas what has all the Otani cards uh, uh, started at? First of all, he, he wasn't like Aaron Judge and didn't have all this Bowman stuff for years. I mean, Aaron Judge has been in all these Bowman products for years and years and years and years. Autographs and cards and parallels. I mean, the, the, the quantity of Aaron judge stuff out there before he blew up was just amazing. That's why, you know, some of it was so cheap. 
Otani hasn't had anything. You know, he's over there in Japan, and maybe there was some of this weird off-brand stuff floating around. But until Tops, I think they made a couple Tops Now cards. And then they came out with Heritage. And then what Panini has them in, was it Donruss or Diamond Kings? Or one of, one of their baseball products has autographs and a bunch of cards. Otani didn't have anything. And those cards started at a huge number. Those autographs and Heritage were several thousand dollars even when he was sucking ass in spring training. So to me, that's, uh, it's not as fun. Otani isn't as fun as Aaron Judge. To me, Aaron Judge is, is the best story. The guys that go from the $5 autograph to 1000 that to me is uh, the best story, the best opportunity to make money, the best, you know, hey, I'm going to go dig through all my boxes and find you know, these Aaron Judge cards. It's like Lynn Sanity. When Jeremy Lynn popped off, you went, you rushed back to all your 09, 010 stuff to find his cards. When Steph Curry stopped tweaking his ankle every three seconds and he became an MVP player and a championship winner, everybody rushed back to see, you know, what Steph Curry cards they had. We see this happen quite often in the hobby through across a bunch of different sports. Last year, perfect example with Judge. Whereas you're not going to see that with Otani. His stuff, you know, the price is already baked in. His autograph is already, you know, several hundred, if not several thousand dollars. His rookie card is already priced, you know, at an uh, unattainable level. Where's it going to go? Could he win MVP in Cy Young? How much it, will his card prices really go up? So how much is it, quote, an investment to be buying his cards right now? That even in the best possible scenario, he wins MVP and Cy Young. How much is this stuff really worth? Above and beyond what it's selling for now. Where's the downside? If he gets hurt, if he just sucks, if one, if you know, the hitting or the pitching starts to take a dive, there'll be questions. Oh, should he stop pitching? Should he stop hitting? Should he not be playing so much? Oh, he got hurt. Oh, the blisters on his hand is affecting his hitting. He's he's uh, he's very he's a very risky person to be one buying or investing in or or whatever you you wanna you wanna call it. If you're looking for a return at some point, he's super risky. This guy, because the price is already baked in, and the risk that he's gonna get hurt is extremely high the risk that he's going to suck is there because all guys go through struggles so it's interesting it, Otani to me I, I, it's it's obviously some a player people are talking about and uh, his card prices are probably driving a lot of a lot of the products and, but it's not as exciting as Aaron Judge who was a $5 card $5 autograph that goes to 1000 all of a sudden. One way, even if you're not buying Otani cards, um, Topps does have an affiliate program. And you know for sure Topps is going to be cranking out these uh, Otani Tops Now, Tops Living, Tops Moment of the Week. I mean, they have a new thing kind of coming out every week with these cards. Um, Topps, so Topps has an affiliate program, uh, much like eBay does and Amazon does and pretty much all e-commerce uh, sites do. To where if somebody clicks through your link and then goes buy an Otani card or really anything off the Topps website, you get a percentage of the sale. It's very small on the Topps website. It's 3%. But uh, like most things in sports cards, it converts really well. I, I think I've, I've only driven a few hundred clicks to it. And, uh, and I think this month there's been like four or $5,000 in sales to Topps Now cards, Topps Living cards, and those Topps Moment of the Week cards. Because people buy them. And uh, you only get 3%, so it's, it's uh, even off $4,000 in sales, it's, it's still a pretty small number, just, uh, you know, 150 bucks or something. I don't know, my math is $120 maybe. But it is a way uh, to take advantage of kind of this Otani mania, especially if you have a blog or a website or something. These are areas where, yeah, hey, you can pick up an extra $100, $200 this month on your website by just um, 
being a part of this TOPS affiliate program and kind of taking advantage of this Otani wave. Now, it's not something you're going to be able to do probably consistently because some of these orders that, that have come through on this top site are specifically for Otani and they're big orders. So, and that, that you know, this only happens every so often. It happened last year with Judge. We've seen it happen with Chris Bryant and, and Trout and Bryce Harper. And for a month, there was Trevor Story broke out. And for about two months, Yaciel Puig, a, few, many, a couple years ago, broke out. We see this happen all the time. Sometimes guys break out and become stars and kind of become legends. Sometimes guys break out and then eh, they're just kind of average guys. So we've seen that happen over the years. And the, it, the way you want to join the affiliate program, you can't go to the TOPS website. You've actually got to go to, uh, you're going to have to search for this. The, the Warriors sponsor, they sponsor the Warriors jerseys. If you know the, the Golden State Warriors. It's like Rick, Rick Kukin or I don't know, Link Synergy or something like that. Check it out. Um, you've got to sign up for that affiliate program and then you've got to search the advertisers. Be sure to fill out your profile really well. I think that helps when you're applying to advertisers, especially if you have no history on that program and you haven't sold anything. And I think advertisers a lot of times can see your stats on the, on the, how you're doing kind of on the affiliate program. So fill out your profile really well on that, on that, uh, Link Synergy or whatever site it is, apply for tops, and fingers crossed they still have somebody monitoring that and they accept you. But uh, it does pay out. I've gotten paid um, several times. Uh, they pay you through PayPal, and uh, yeah, it's cool to get a uh, essentially a PayPal deposit from tops. So something to think about there. Maybe you've you know maybe you're in this camp where you've taken a break from Otani. Maybe this judge mania and this Otana mania has, has driven you to the edge and, you, and you've taken a break from collecting. You know, what should you do? What should you do at that point? And I mentioned that you probably don't know this, but you've taken breaks. You probably have taken breaks with other things that you join in your life. I wrote down a couple things. I've taken a break from really going to live baseball games. I used to go to like 50, 100 baseball games a year for two, three year stretch. I've taken a break from that. Now, when I move to Tempe, Arizona, it's probably going to be something that's going to be rekindled. And uh, when I talk about Tempe, I'll, I'll, I'll mention a little bit of the baseball watching side of that. What about Pearl Jam? You think I listen to Pearl Jam every day? Of course not. I could go, you know, weeks or months listening to other types of music, listening to older 60s, 70s rock music or listening to another band or listening to to rap or something. But just because I take breaks from Pearl Jam doesn't mean I'm not, you know, planning for the next concert trip or uh, excited about the new album that's going to come out. And uh, sometimes you can you know, that break, and then you come back and you can actually listen to, you know, their entire catalog again. And really it's, you know, it's almost fresh because you, you haven't heard it in a few months or a while. So these are things you've probably done too. These, you know, you've taken breaks from things that you're really passionate about and you really enjoy. You can take weeks, months, year long breaks sometimes from these things. What about collecting? I think one thing that I'm doing now, I'm not actively buying cards on check on my cards. Uh, I have a very small place in here in Vegas. I'm moving to a bigger place, but I don't, I don't have a lot of room to have a bunch of cards and slabs and, you know, all this shit and Pelican boxes. And, you know, sometimes I see this shit and I'm like, damn, these motherfuckers have to have like an extra room in their house for these cards and stuff and these dis- displays. And what if you got in the autographs and like baseballs and jerseys? I mean, good Lord. You need like a five bedroom mansion out in the hills or something. So one of the things I'm doing, if I'm taking a break right now, I'm not buying a whole lot. I'm moving around a lot. I'm distracted. I'm going to the pool. I'm, you know, enjoying the Vegas life and hoping to go down and enjoy the the Tempe life here. But one of the things I'm doing in preparing for, uh, specifically on check on my cards where I do a lot of my card buying both from a personal level, you know, most of my cards in my personal box, I do have a couple small personal boxes. Those either came from the check on my cards or it came from the national, to be honest. 
99% of the stuff that's in there. So on check out my cards, one, I'm saving some money. I'm recalibrating uh, my thought process. And I'm going to really go after some of the players I like. And kind of prospect a little bit of ba- uh, basketball, but also if I go start w- going to a little bit more baseball games, especially minor league games, I can get back into prospecting baseball. So I'm really excited about that. So I'm saving some money up to buy some of those Lonzo Ball cards when you guys forget about them. And there's another fresh crop of rookies, and maybe the Lakers have a free agent or two coming aboard, and maybe uh, you know people are doubting Lonzo and his shot. His card prices are going to get depressed as more cards come on to check on my cards. The inventory rises. Lonzo's not playing anything but video games, apparently, recently. So his name's not going to be in the news unless his dad puts it there. And and that's good for card buying. Another guy in the Lakers who had a strong rookie year, Kyle Kuzma. His card price is probably about as high as Lonzo right now. But a guy that I I might want to dip and invest in. A guy that I've talked about many times on this show, Brandon Ingram, who had a very, 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 very good year. If you watch a lot of Lakers games, it's like, wow, this guy's like a pretty good player right now at age 20 or whatever he is. Certainly he's got a lot of room to grow, but good Lord, the step he took this year was really big. And his cards have hovered about the same price, I would say, that they were to start the season. There was some hype coming into the season with him because he had a great summer league game. I think he had like 23 points. That's where I really was like blown away. And I still haven't seen that player. That's what's exciting about me. The game that I saw him play in, in summer league, that prompted me to go start to buy his cards. I still have not seen that player on the court yet for long stretches and he had a really good year i think he averaged like 15 16 a game like four or five assists four or five six rebounds he's 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 uh taking it to the rim and finishing and get fouled something that's that's not that easy to do the guys make it look easy but it's not that easy to do in the nba and he made it look his footwork improved um gosh if he takes another big step in his improvement, which we've seen guys do and is possible. Um, He he could be an all-star caliber player for sure or higher than that because he's so long, he's 6'10". So again, a guy that we've talked a lot about on this podcast and whose cards will probably take a little bit of a dip because he's he's not going to play in summer league. He's going to go, you know, into hibernation. The Lakers are going to be making a lot of noise and being talked a lot about in free agency and how that shakes out could impact, you know, some of these guys. Could Brandon Ingram get traded to San Antonio for Kawhi Leonard? Maybe. Maybe. I think Kuzma and Lonzo are fairly safe. Lonzo more than Kuzma. But could I see a scenario where Ingram gets traded, especially if we're bringing in a Paul George who uh, is a similar ish player or similar positions I guess so but this is a really a long-winded way to say this is one way to kind of stay motivated while you're taking a break from collecting I'm still interested in these players and when the time is right for Lonzo for Kuzma and really I think I could be dipping into Ingram right now because um, he got hurt toward the end of the year and his stuff's a little softer than Kuzma and Lonzo but I'm still interested in these guys, and I'm ready. I'm stacking up some paper over on Check on My Cards to make some moves and do some purchases in the summer. And so probably in a few short months, I'll go from being in a break from collecting to being checking Check on My Cards every day for Lonzo cards, for Kuzma cards, for Ingram cards. From uh, uh, There's a Torian Prince for the Atlanta that I've seen play a few times. He's an interesting like wing kind of 3 and D type player. But with the potential to be more of a score, because he's aggressive. Like the times I've seen him, like he's aggressive. He's not a great shooter, but he's aggressive. And um, if he works on his game, he has an interesting body. So, and his stuff is like dirt cheap. I mean, it's probably a guy that, you know, you don't even know who that is. I mean, Atlanta was so garbage this year. But I did watch a few Atlanta games and uh, Torian Prince, I think he went to Baylor. Interesting guy. Guy, 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 you should, you know, check out some YouTube highlights and somebody who, 
probably will have to change teams to ever break out and maybe probably will never break out, but his stuff's so cheap right now. I mean, it's, you know, he's in the penny nickel dime bin right now that it's worth taking a shot at some of the stuff. And there's some other guys too that, that I'm interested in. And I want to get back into prospecting baseball too, because that's where most, a lot of the focus and dollars are. And you and look at a guy like judge. I had about 50, 60 Aaron judge cards when he blew up because I had went and seen him play and he hit a home run. And I went and bought some of his cards. So I want to get back in a little bit of, I want to get back to doing that. Um, and while I'm taking a break right now, I'm one of the conscious things I'm doing is saving some money over on check on my cards. Cause I know that's where I'm going to be doing a lot of purchasing. So that's just one small thing you can do when you're taking a break. You could save money for when you know you're going to come back. I can't think of a better better thing to do than to save a couple bucks uh, knowing you're going to come back and spend it. And also having a plan. I definitely have a plan. I definitely have some players. I raffled off four, Ingram, Kuzma, Lonzo, and this Torian Prince character. These are guys I want to buy. These are guys that I will be buying on check out my cards, probably once the smoke kind of clears on the basketball season and people maybe start focusing on some of this incoming uh, crop of rookies and maybe even more cards have hit check on my cards at this point. So just, uh, just some thoughts there. If you have, if you yourself has some thoughts on, you know, what, what are some of the things that when you took a break that you wish you would have done or um, could have done when you were taking your break from collecting to make it easier when you got back. Maybe maybe you weren't up on the sets. You know, you hear about this all the time about guys who leave the hobby back in, you know, maybe the 90s or early 2000s and then they come back now and it's like totally different. It's like what are these jersey cards and serial numbers and who has the license and who's exclusive and all this kind of random stuff. It can be a little confusing. So maybe there's ways you can kind of stay up on the hobby even if you're not physically buying cards or interested in it so much maybe there's periodically you've got to keep yourself updated but let me know if there's some things that you've done or th things that you can think of uh for sure sports card news on twitter sports card show at gmail.com that kind of goes to both my brother and i who knows who will uh answer you there but let me know if you got any ideas on uh you know what what you what you should do if you're taking a break Time to get to the text line, though. If you, if you want to text the show, and it, full disclosure, it might be read on the air, 702-900-2149. Again, that number is text only, please. Please don't call me. 702-900-2149. I won't pick up anyways. Okay. First text uh, from the 216 area code. Great job on the TOPS podcast Good luck with the young lady. Wow, I think that, that one's directed at me. Or I know my brother's married. So, um, you know, things actually went really well with that girl. I, that, that was like, the I think, the first time I met her. And I think I've hung out with her every weekend or almost every weekend um, up until, yeah, I got to leave. So um, a little bit of sad moment. Yeah, yeah, that I got to leave the... The young lady in Vegas, but Tempe's calling, Arizona's calling, and so yeah, good luck with the young lady. Hey, it was good luck. Hey, we did pretty good. Next, uh, next text. This comes from the seven hundred three area code. Wow, this might be close. You guys are too crazy when you get together. Yeah, I'm telling you, when a story breaks, like Tops is being rumored for sale, the rush of that is as good as any cocaine you're going to find on the Las Vegas Strip. I'm going to tell you that much right now. Last text, this is 201 area code. I had this 1992 Bowman style tops card made to get signed by the one and only Gary Vaynerchuk at his recent New Jersey book signing. Uh, this guy, uh, Gary V is one of the people rumored to be uh, in the running to purchase tops and then this is according to Gary V himself he even put out a video of him talking to one of the former owners and founders of tops and talking about how he was on the phone striking I mean it's an extraordinary video extraordinary video 
I, I encourage you to listen to the last sports card show podcast with my brother where we talk all about this. But somebody sent us a text. Actually, this is pretty cool. V- Gary Vaynerchuk card. He's holding up a New, New Jersey, uh, New Jersey, um, New York Jets jersey. And he says, I have this 1992 Bowman style tops card made to get signed by Gary V at his recent New Jersey book signing. I hope he buys tops. I saw him at shows in Jersey as a kid, and he was a hustler on another level, even as a kid. And Gary V, the super popular kind of uh, motivational kind of guy, he writes books. He has one of, the, I think, the mo- one of the most popular books on Amazon right now. And he owns some media companies, kind of involved in all kinds of different stuff. Well, he credits his entire career to uh, these early days of selling baseball cards. So uh, super interesting guy, super passionate about cards and, and the Topps company uh, itself, and certainly a guy who I'm rooting for to end up uh, buying Topps as well. So from 201 area code, thanks for the picture. I think it's pretty cool. And trust me, over here in the 702 area code, I'm rooting for this fool to buy Topps too. So fingers crossed these things can take a long time too. And like the article said, if if, if – uh, if we remember, uh, it mentioned that the candy business has probably got to go first because they probably have multiple people who are interested in the sports card business and uh, they've got to off the candy business first. So fingers crossed, Gary V. Uh, and a, a thing I noticed, a little, little, little small little nugget here, Michael Eisner, the current owner of Tops, follows Gary V on Twitter. So a little little connection there. Uh, something something maybe in the future we'll discuss on uh, one of these shows, hopefully. So we're on the move. I'm on the move from Vegas, uh, from California to Vegas down to Tempe, Arizona. And I'm moving down there for several reasons. Every time I go down there, I'm just like in love with the place. And the heat certainly is not something that bothers me. I grew up in, in a valley in California that was oftentimes super hot. One of the hottest parts actually of California that I grew up in. So the heat doesn't really bo- bother me. I'm in Vegas now. It's super hot here. So, and you know, a couple things I'm really looking forward to is certainly rekindling watching baseball. And there's this, one of the lowest levels of baseball there, the AZL league. This isn't the fall league. This is actually a rookie uh, league. That starts, I believe, uh, first or second week of June and runs through August. And it's it's the lowest level you can get. Some of these guys are super young. It's guys that recently got drafted. So I'm going to get to be able to see uh, guys who, who recently got picked. Um, and they play at the spring training stadiums. The games are totally free. There's no concessions. You can just walk in which will be fun. It'll be probably me and my 15 closest friends there in 120 degree heat watching these 16 year old kids. Uh, some of them play baseball, but that'll be really exciting. I'm super looking forward to that. And, um, you know why I'm living in, if you know the area, why I'm living in Tempe over a place like Scottsdale, probably it's a place that I'm better suited. They have some better buildings. They have some actually places that I would really like to live in Scottsdale physically. And Tempe, if, if you're not familiar, is where ASU lives. I'm going to be li- living literally kind of in the heart of ASU in this kind of college town area. And I'm kind of an old, older middle age, not middle age, but kind of, you know, older back half millennial guy. My college days are long behind me now, but I think I want, I'm living in Tempe because if I lived in Scottsdale, I would never leave Scottsdale and I would probably would never go to Phoenix and I would never have any reason to go to Tempe, but I really like Tempe. Every time I've stayed down there, I'm like, Oh, this is cool down here. This is like hip and stuff. You got ASU right here and you got sporting events that could pop off anytime down there. Literally you could walk outside my place and see the ASU football stadium. So for me, it's like, well, I would rather live in Tempe and then go visit Phoenix, which is a a short car right away or, and also go visit old town Scottsdale. There's a restaurant I really like in um, Scottsdale as well. One of my favorite restaurants actually. So that's my thought process there. Instead of living in 
Scottsdale where I would never leave. I would find places I like to eat. I would find grocery stores I like to go to. And I, there's some incredible, nice buildings, uh, expensive buildings that I would want to live in. Um, I think I'm going to go live in Tempe because uh, the vibe will be a little different down there, a little bit younger, hipper. And uh, I'm excited, especially to go watch baseball as well. I mean, that's that's uh, super exciting to be doing that. But been here in Vegas five months. Most of you probably have come here. And if you haven't, you should get off your ass and come here. Don't be fucking scared. Anybody who thinks you're going to get shot or, oh, this or that about Vegas. I've, I've never felt more safe in my life living somewhere. I'm never scared to walk down the street or that I'm going to get shot or that I've never had any kind of sketchy moment happen to me here. Again, you got to be smart about yourself. You can't be walking, you know, in the ghetto. And uh, once you get off the strip, it gets ghetto uh, pretty, pretty super quick. But uh, quickly, uh, dining options, best Mexican food, probably the best Mexican food I've ever had or the closest to authentic Mexican food I've ever had. Javier's and the Aria, certainly want to have that if you're into Mexican. It's a little heavy, so be prepared to eat and just be prepared for that, that it, it, is, it is authentic, good, heavy Mexican food and you're going to eat a lot. Best meal, I think just the flat out the best meal you can get in Vegas is Mastro's in uh, the Crystals. Uh, just top to bottom, everything I think you can get there is phenomenal. The salmon, the, the blackened salmon, the bone-in fillets, the top sirloins. They have, I think, like a roasted chicken. I think they have a sushi selection. The sides are phenomenal, phenomenal sides. Oh, just top to bottom, the mac and cheese, the truffle, Alaskan something, uh, the shoestring potato fries, uh, the vegetables are on point, which which you think might be, oh, what, they're vegetables. Now you can get some sh- pretty shitty vegetables once you get out of uh, California, trust me, I know that for a fact, but um, best meal for sure, Mastro's, it's going to run you... Uh, before drinks, it's going to run you about 50, 60 a plate. Javier's cheaper. It's going to be more in the before drinks, maybe like 25, 30 a plate. Depends what you get. Best cheap options on the strip really are Shake Shack. We've talked about that on that show. It's a company you can buy stock in. I recommended the stock at 30. I think you can check right now. I think it's at 40 something. My dad even called me and thanked me about that the other day because I recommended that to him. So he's up a little bit of money thanks to me. Shake Shack for sure. The uh, the burgers, meh. They're known for their burgers, and that's probably what they want to be known for. To me, the burgers aren't aren't the greatest thing on the strip. I'd rather go to In and Out for sure, and maybe even a few other places for a burger. To me, the Chicken Shack is the best fast casual menu item period across everything anything you can think of i mean people you know drop to their knees and and blow chick-fil-a on a daily basis and it's chick-fil-a is okay the chicken shack at shake shack blows away any chicken that's made at chick-fil-a so i'll leave you with that it's a 6.99 i mean you can't get much cheaper on the strip 6.99 chicken shack wow phenomenal uh, pizza is very hard, hard to come by good pizza. And I'm very picky about my pizza. It's gotta be fresh. Uh, you couldn't pay me, literally couldn't pay me to eat Domino's pizza hut or any of that shit. Little Caesars. I mean, no, a lot of times I'll make my own pizza, own ingredients, high quality cheese, sauce, all that good stuff or stuff that I like. Um, so good pizza to me is hard to come by. Uh, chain stuff to me is a lot of times really bad uh, or just not the quality isn't there you can tell the cheese is frozen or the dough's frozen or the the sauce is just you know not freshly made so for value to me uh, secret pizza up in the third floor of the cosmopolitan for value for 575 a slice or for about 30 bucks i think for the whole pie and it's a huge pie you and like your four buddies could get you know could eat this thing Five seventy-five a slice. It tastes fresh. It tastes good. You can see them hand tossing the dough and all that stuff. So for the value there, Secret Pizza to me is the best. That's third floor in the Cosmopolitan Hotel on the Vegas Strip. If you're coming to Vegas, where to stay? 
you have so many options and you probably get blown up your email box if you're on some kind of email list you're getting blown up on a daily basis to me and this is these are almost ranked in order of where i would stay on the vegas strip okay number one the mandarin oriental that's one of the top hotels in the world so that's clearly where you'd want to stay it's obviously going to be very expensive Vidara, number two, that is behind the Aria, it is a non-casino, non-smoking, hotel-only place. Very nice rooms, very quiet, great place to take uh, a wife or uh, somebody you're interested in um, over the Vidara. Rooms are clean, smells great, a uh, little more quiet back there, but you're literally, you could literally walk next door the cosmopolitan next door the aria or right like next next door the aria and so you're in the heart of it all and there's even a little tram down you walk or take a little tram down the bellagio so you're next to like three of the hottest places um to me at the vidara so mandarin one most pretty expensive vidara you can get a good value at the vidara that's why you always want to check the vidara that's an mgm property too uh Across from the Vidara or next to it is the Aria. And actually I'm looking at that the Aria right now. My 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 room my my place overlooks the Aria. So uh, again that has a casino that you're in the heart of it all. You're next to Mastros, you're next to Javier's, you're next to all these places that I'm telling you to go anyways to eat. So you might as well stay at the Aria. Good rooms and uh, fun atmosphere, right? Right boom smack dab in the in the best part of vegas in my opinion next door to ario cosmo um little younger hipper place uh if you if you want a club if you want to go to the pool uh definitely a place you want to hit up cosmopolitan and and again you got to go find secret pizza up on the third floor there uh on the uh, the casino level next to, next to cosmo bellagio a uh, pretty st standard staple place. Most of you probably heard about this place, if not stayed there. They have the big water show, uh, which I think is a little overrated, but I've seen it, I don't know, four or five times now, or I went, anytime I'm walking by, I also see it. But Bellagio, nice rooms, good place to stay. A little older vibe there, a little bit older money, a little you know, suited and booted kind of place, but uh, still a, a five-star establishment out here on the Vegas Strip. Next, win or the encore. And if you're a single guy, younger guy, and you want to see some ladies, uh, you want to make your way over to the win uh, or the encore pool for sure. And great place to stay. Good atmosphere in there. Clean. Smells great. A um, little bit of a different vibe over there. Uh, a little further north than where I am. But win, encore, definitely could stay there. It's going to come a little shocker if, if you're you know, a hardcore Democrat here. You might want to turn this off but another great place to stay is trump tower and actually if you're looking to buy a place in vegas the best value right now is trump fucking tower you can get a fucking like trump tower room for like 230 grand just dirt cheap comparatively if you bought a room in the vidara it'd be about 450 500 000 for like their standard room that you could either one live in or that they would do like a rev share where they would uh sell it out for you or rent it out for you or whatever and you would just um, it become kind of an investment property. So at the Vidar, it's 450 At Trump Tower, you can get a fucking room for 230 And on the back at, uh, uh, side of the Trump Tower, they're building this kind of crazy. I don't think it's, it's going to be that impressive, but they're building a resort world. So if you lived at the back of the Trump Tower, your view for the last, since you moved in, is this dirt property. And Trump was even going to build another tower, and that kind of fell through. But in about a year or two, your view on the backside could become fucking amazing because you're going to be able to overlook this brand new Vegas spread. And maybe even I, there might be a wind property going up on the very corner too. Interesting uh, piece of property out there in Trump Tower. It's kind of isolated right now. But if that's part of the strip kind of comes up a little bit from that resort world and if wind buys another property or MGM's even rumored to buy wind. So maybe that area gets a, you know kind of developed or comes in a little different. Trump Tower could be an interesting place, and the perception, obviously, of Trump could change quite a bit from today. Uh, obviously, he's you know he's under the uh, white hot spotlight. Uh, there was a time where George Bush was probably his, the uh, the son, the second George Bush. Um, 
he was probably hated as much as Trump in some circles. So, and now people have really softened to George W. So long winded thing to say that if you want to stay in a nice place, Trump tower is very nice. I've stayed there a few times and uh, the rooms are very, very nice. Again, it's one of these non casino, non smoking places. So it's, it's, it's clean. It, the air is a little different in there. You notice it. The smog's really bad out here in Vegas. And then when you go into these damn casinos, you fucking smell cigarettes. And I don't smoke cigarettes. So it's something you notice and it's something that can kind of bother you. So when you go into a cleaner place like the Vidara, like the Mandarin, like the building I live in, like Trump Tower, you notice it. And it, it, you know, you're like, oh, wow, this is kind of a cool place. If you want to stay off strip, one recommended run rec I do have is Palms Place. Neck, don't stay at Palms. Stay at Palms Place. The condo towers behind and spring for a one bedroom because man those are those are freaking sweet so if you want to live in vegas i've said this multiple times even on this podcast why move to vegas if you don't move to the strip the fucking off the strip sucks it's ghetto as fuck that's where you might get shot that's where you might fucking get killed it's dirty it's super dirty um, and it re- kind of reminds me of where I just came from uh, in the California area. So to me, there's really, frankly, unless you get put up at a suite at the Aria, the Vidara, or one of these kind of hotels, there's really only, frankly, two places you want to live. Above the, I think it's like the 40th floor in the Mandarin are um, residential uh, condos, or I don't know what you want to call them, just rooms that you can buy, that you can purchase. And again, the Mandarin's like the seventh best rated hotel in the entire world. And then you could live on the motherfucking top floor. Your views up there are going to be super incredible. No matter what side you're on, you're either going to get a sunset view or you're going to get a strip view. And even I think this is a small detail. The windows open a little bit up there on the the upper floors of the Mandarin. So that's, uh, you know, if you want to get a little fresh air, you can do that as well. The only other place to live, I think, is the building that I live in, the Veer Towers, most of the time you come to Vegas and um, you might see these things and not you might see the Veer Tower and not even know what the fuck it is. It's next to the um, Aria right on the strip and uh, super nice building. Super. They have some super, super nice uh, places with some uh, some good views. And uh, it's not a hotel. You can't rent this place by the night. You can't go on Airbnb and rent this place. You have to do 30 day. uh rentals minimum and it's a great place to live i wish i could take this building with me and some of the amenities and the pool and the gym and all this kind of stuff that i've been using and uh just the quality of the building too uh i can't hear my neighbors i can't hear the people below me or you know above me i mean just the the quality of the construction uh, is really good so veer towers and veer tower is going to be definitely cheaper than the mandarin um i'm not on that level to to be at the mandarin but Definitely two places if you were thinking about ever living on the Strip. Mandarin, Veer, to me, those are the only two places. Um, oh, a couple of celebrities that I've seen just walking. This is just random, like when you're walking around, you see me. I saw Floyd Mayweather shopping one day. I saw, uh, was he Kentucky coach John Calipari in the Aria one day walking through in full, was it Kentucky? Kentucky, Kansas? I don't know. One of the blue schools. Uh, you can tell I'm not up on college basketball, but I it was definitely uh, John Calipari. thought that was interesting. Flavor Flav for anybody in the 1980s, early 90s hip-hop game with the big clock. He was literally, he literally walked through Hooters and he had, yes, he had a fucking clock on. Like it was fucking hysterical. I just couldn't believe it. And he even stopped and played a couple hands of blackjack. It was hysterical. And then if you are... Um, of the bachelor watching fame, Josh, the baseball player. And I think he, he I think he, I think he won I think he, or he got hitched with the girl. I think it was Andy or whatever her name was. Saw him one day at the Mandarin, uh, taking some pictures for him. He was on the cover of a magazine in front of a, it was like a Bentley or Rolls Royce or something. So saw him one day actually when I was walking by the Mandarin. So advice, if you're coming to Vegas, Take it in small doses. I see people come here and they walk and they get their feet sore and they damn near go home, you know, just like destroyed because they try to see everything. They try to go see the sign. They try to go see downtown. They try to go see the wind. They try to come back down the MGM. They try to go see a show. Take a breath. Take it in very small doses. 
This place is very confusing. Getting to one end of the strip when you've never been here before your first two, three times to the other is so confusing. And this place seems so huge. It seems like you're in the middle of you know, New York or Los Angeles when you get here. Just take smaller doses. Stay at the Aria. Go to Javier's. Figure out how to go to Mastro's. Figure out how to go have lunch at Shake Shack. Figure out how to go from the Aria over to the Cosmopolitan. A couple different ways you could do it. Maybe it's hot outside. Maybe you want to go inside. Maybe you want to go outside. Take it in real small doses. Don't crisscross the entire strip trying to see everything. Once you learn one casino, getting in and out, learning where the Uber pickup in and out is, learning where you're going to get dropped off at becomes much easier to kind of digest the other casinos and the other properties. And pretty soon, honestly, Vegas becomes really small. And uh, to me, that's what Vegas has become is I can get you from one end of the strip to the other in, you know, 10 minutes if we have to, 15 minutes. And uh, so I don't I don't waste all my time walking and trying to figure out where I am. Once you kind of know all that stuff, Vegas becomes actually really, really small. Because there's probably only a few places you really like. There's probably a a lot of places you're never going to go. And um, comes for me, becomes a a much more enjoyable place. Because you can focus on what you really like, the places you really like, and the the atmosphere you kind of want to be in. So take it in really small doses. Commit to maybe coming every year or once every couple years. And just stay at a nice place. And I gave you where to fucking stay. Mandarin, Vidara, Aria, Cosmopolitan, Bellagio, Wynn, Encore, Trump Tower. Or if you feeling frisky and want to do off strip Palms Place, that's where you want to stay. Work away around those areas, learn those areas, walk around, get up, ask, ask people how to get from one end to the other if you have to. And pretty soon Vegas will become really small. And, um, you know, when you when you come, you won't waste your time getting from one end to the other. How do I get over here? How do I get from the airport to here? You'll be able to enjoy Vegas a lot more. And obviously, if you ever have any questions, if you're coming here, if you're planning a trip, if you you know, how do I how do I get this house? What's the price on this? What's the price on the rooms here? When should I come? You can always reach out to me. Again, I'm a Vegas veteran. I've come here probably 40 times before I moved here, and now I've lived out here five six months. So you can always reach out to me. Sports card news, sports card show at gmail.com. That'll get to me too. And that's probably all I got. You can also text 702 900 2149. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being patient. And there will be more podcasts uh, coming, especially in the next few months as we inch closer to one of my favorite events of the year, the National. So you can bet I'll be back in Cleveland uh, this year.